Travis Jankowski made the catch of the year. Jack Leiter's back up in the big leagues. And after one start in AAA, Kamar Rocker might be joining him soon. Talk about all that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers. Your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You are locked onto the World Series champion Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan covering this team for 11 seasons, including all six as the founder and host of this podcast. Thank y'all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick, follow the show at Locked On Rangers, hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform and on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Now, before we get into Kamar Rocker's dominant AAA debut, Jack Lyon showing some mixed bag in his start back at the big league level and Travis Jankowski making one of the best catches I've ever seen a Texas Rangers player or anybody make in baseball. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. And you know what time it is? It is time to give Travis Jankowski some love. This man just made one of the greatest catches I have ever seen in, albeit a game that didn't really matter against a team that's quite terrible, in the second game of a doubleheader in which there were dozens of people in attendance, but there were probably a lot more watching on the internet for Travis Jankowski to rob a potential walk-off home run by Andrew Vaughn in the bottom of the ninth inning of the second game of the doubleheader last night. I don't think a player has ever made more of an impact in a game without getting a single plate appearance. Heck, while only playing half an inning. That's all Travis Jankowski did. He came in as a defensive replacement for Wyatt Langford in the bottom of the ninth inning, something that I really love about Bruce Bochy as a manager that he's done since day one of this first regular season game with the Rangers is that he comes from the National League and he, throughout that, has learned the value of defensive replacements. Even if it's just for one inning, two innings of work, he is always going to close the game out if his team is winning with that best defensive lineup out there. Now, the nice thing about his infield is that they're pretty much all pretty darn good defenders. If not gold glove caliber, then at least above average. The weakest link is Corey Seager, and he's a pretty good defensive shortstop. Now, um, maybe soon that will end up being leading to uh, Adoles Garcia and right field being replaced more often, but just getting that extra guy out there because you never know when it'll make the difference. And last night, it absolutely did. This was another rough, rough game for Andrew Chafman, who just has not been good for the most part with the Rangers. He's had a couple of pretty decent outings, but for the most part, it has been uh, deeply frustrating with Andrew Chafin. And since the Rangers used their ideal 7th, 8th, and ninth inning guys in the first game of this doubleheader, you thought, oh boy, what are they going to do with the bullpen for the second game? especially with Jack Leiter on the hill and Jack Leiter not having a history in his major league career of going very deep into games. Get four innings out of him. You got to give a huge shout out to Jose Ureña going four innings as well and four innings of shutout ball as well. But Travis Jankowski making that leaping grab, he has been the subject of my ire for, uh, well, at times this season, not his own fault. He's had a truly terrible offensive year. Outside of that bacon-saving home run, pinch-hit home run in game one of the season, a couple of nice defensive plays here and there because El Blondi will always make some nice defensive plays here and there. But this one is just special. You don't often see a walk-off home run robbed, and you don't see it robbed like that. I mean, he got all the way up there on the fence. Half his torso, actually most of his torso was up above the wall. It kind of reminds me in water polo 
where the gold standard for water polo is getting all the way to your hips out of the water by treading water that well. That's a very, very difficult thing to do. And getting basically his hips to the top of the wall. I mean, most of his body is over that railing in the bullpen. He barely gets his glove on the ball. It's so far out there. It is so high up there. And Jankowski just gets his glove on it, keeps it in the glove. It kind of rattles around just a little bit in that glove. But, I mean, the Gary Matthews Jr. catch is... It's got to be the best catch in Rangers franchise history. I mean, it, as my friend Brent Bielefeld told me last night uh, when we were talking about the greatest catches in Rangers history, he said, Gary Matthews Jr.'s catch has got to be the best ever because he turned into a full-on spider monkey to make that catch. And while that is true, and he ran up the wall and turned halfway back around the you know timing to go get there, um, he had less time to get. It was more of a line drive home run that he robbed and still got just about as high up there. Jankowski had a little bit more time to get there. It felt like that ball was in the air for forever, but that is, I mean, the last 20 years, I don't remember exactly when that Gary Matthews Jr. catch was, but maybe at least the last 10 years, 15 years, that is the best catch in Rangers franchise history. The only ones that are close are that Eli White 2022 home run robbery. I can't remember exactly who that one was against, but Eli White made some incredible catches. And then, well... Last year, Travis Jankowski himself against the Seattle Mariners, making that play up against the fence in right center field, robbing a home run ball against the Mariners in the bullpen. I believe that was sometime in June, and the Rangers needed every single one of those wins. I don't think that would have been a game tying or go ahead, but it would have made things a lot closer um, in that game against the Mariners. But this one was just absolutely special, and I think that he needs a full one war bump on his season war numbers. I think his his war is in the negatives right now because offensively he has been, uh, well, quite bad. Um, But still, defensively, he's your fourth outfielder, him offensively being quite bad. Okay, it's at negative 0.2 right now. And it is, according to baseball reference, he's at negative 0.2 war season. I'm assuming before this, it must have been negative 1.2 because that was a whole win. He stole a whole win with that catch, and it was absolutely sensational. I mean, a good game overall by the Rangers, a good game by by Grant Anderson coming in with the bases loaded after that because Chafin blocked a guy to load the bases, and then Grant Anderson comes in and gets the job done, gets out of it. The Rangers take the first two. I believe they have now won 10, or maybe it's 11 in a row against the, against the White Sox, have a chance to lose just one game to the White Sox all season and win, I believe, the other 12, if my math is mathing correctly, which it might not be. Um, but just one of those moments and those highlights that, you know, you're sitting there, we're in late August, the Rangers are not mathematically eliminated just, just yet, but feels pretty much uh, eliminated. It was a frustrating game one with a lot of toot blands. I mean, just an unreasonable number of toot blands in such a short period that I feel like everyone just must have drank toot bland juice heading into it. And you had Corey Seager with a four hit day and there was so much of nobody on base that he only got one RBI. Ended up being the game winning RBI, but still um, not ideal for your guy who is one of the best hitters on the planet, getting nobody on base in front of him. But just moments like that, games like that, you know, just having those kind of, uh, you know, special experiencing it in real time. It's fun to watch the replays on social media and stuff, but experiencing it in real time. It's nice to have one of those moments late in the season. that kind of reminds us sickos. Cause if you're listening to this podcast on August 29th or 30th or whenever, at this point in the Rangers season, you also are a sicko that is watching too much baseball, whether your team is good or bad. Getting those moments kind of reminds us, okay, this is why I do this. This is this is why I like this sport. Even when my team is frustrating and disappointing and having a season that is objectively very bad for what they were expected to do, there are still those moments like that that we get to enjoy and celebrate together. And hats off to you, Travis Jankowski. I... No, I'm giving you the full the full Robbie Grossman treatment of I will not say a bad thing about you the rest of this year. I, I will try to hold myself to that. 
But still, it wasn't just Travis Jankowski that was the hero in that when I talked about Jose Urania. We'll get more into lighter in segment two. But Wyatt Langford having an incredible swing right after two defensive misplays by the White Sox. It's just kind of an encapsulation. That whole game was kind of an encapsulation of what's been going wrong with the White Sox. A big three-run homer by, by Wyatt Langford, who has not been having the best season, but again, was in college literally last year. And the fact that he's been about a league average player, a little bit around league average everyday regular at age 22 is frankly something that we should be giving him a lot more credit for, even though he hasn't been what we thought he would be after spring training. Still a nice, nice season coming up. We're going to get into what Kamar Rocker did in his triple A start, why I'm encouraged by Jack Leiter's start, despite what he actually accomplished, and more about his mentality. Right after this word from our sponsors. This show is brought to you by Liquid IV. When you're taking in America's pastime, don't forget to hydrate with Liquid IV's Popsicle Firecracker flavor. A surefire summer hit. Get hydrated with electrolytes, essential vitamins, and clinically tested nutrients from the number one powdered hydration brand in America. Because baseball and summer go together like Liquid IV and indulgent hydration. Blast off with the iconic summer flavor of Popsicle Firecracker, a festive blend of citrus-fueled lemon-lime, tart cherry, and raspberry flavors. Terror, pour, live more. One stick plus 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone. Powered by LIV Hydroscience, an optimized ratio of electrolytes, essential vitamins, and clinically tested nutrients that turn ordinary water, water into extraordinary hydration. No more thirsty summers when you indulge in hydration with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use code MLB at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code MLB at liquidiv.com. This show is brought to you by Game Time. Going to live events is the freaking best, especially when the live events are baseball games. If you want to get yourself to a baseball game, to a Rangers game this season, maybe to watch Jacob deGrom, maybe to see Jack Leiter on a big league hill, there is hill, there is no better place to go get your tickets than Game Time. It is the best way to get tickets, and they've got a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to your favorite events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff and shows you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste your time searching through thousands of tickets. They've got all-in pricing and you toggling this feature shows you the total up front so there are no surprise fees at checkouts. They've also got the lowest price guarantee or Game Time will credit you 110% the difference. That is a kind of deal that you can trust and a very best way to get your tickets is at Game Time. So take the guest time out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKDOWNMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-M-L-B for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. Shout out to the everyday for making Lockdown Rangers your first listen every single day. The Rangers take on the White Sox today, 1 10 p.m. Central Time. First pitch is going to be Nate Eovaldi versus Nick Nestrini on the other side for the White Sox. You can catch every pitch of the Hometown Broadcast on SiriusXM. Just download the SXM and app and search Rangers. Now, last night we got to see Jack Leiter back up in the big leagues after two absolutely phenomenal starts in AAA. After a couple of weeks off, he came back, Jack Leiter did, and looked absolutely magnificent, looked just overpowering against AAA hitters. The fastball velocity was way up. The velocity on everything was way up. And for me, what was more important than that, not that those two things, the velocity and the stuff being absolutely nasty, weren't important, but the confidence, the freeness in his delivery, and the just belief in himself of remembering, oh, oh, that's right. I'm, I'm Jack Leiter. I'm that dude. I'm better than you. And I know it. And I'm going to go out there and destroy you to whoever he is facing in the box. That's the kind of mentality you love to see in a young man on the hill. Now, Guys show it in different ways. Some of them are more boisterous. Some of them are more, you know, loud and in your face and uh, a little more uh, visibly uh, insane in the good way, like Max Scherzer. 
some of them are more quiet and stoic and less emotional and more like a baseball throwing robot like Jacob deGrom when he's on the mound. And Jack is just a little bit more emotional, not quite the Scherzer level of emotional, but still he's got his emotions out there. He is a guy who thrives on that. He is a guy who, you know, has had some difficulties in his first couple of major league starts and overall has pitched better than the numbers indicated in most of those starts. At least the first two, his defense let him down a little bit. He also let him sound, let himself down a little bit, getting too reliant on the fastball. And no matter what kind of big league lineup you're facing, whether it's the Detroit Tigers of early this year that were a terrible offense, or whether it's the Chicago White Sox of now that are a historically terrible offense, big league hitters are really dang good. And don't get it twisted. This is a big league lineup. I know that people are wanting to go make these comparisons to, oh, well, Kamar Rocker did better against, you know, a AAA lineup in the Dodgers that was probably better than who Jack Leiter was facing at the big league level in the White Sox. Stop that. Stop that right now. That is not the case. All of these, oh, well, would this AAA team, would this college team be better than the Chicago White Sox? No. No, they wouldn't. These are still big league hitters. Luis Robert is a good big leaguer. Andrew Vaughn has got some big league potential to be a solid hitter. Same with Gavin Sheets. Same with Andrew Benintendi, as frustrating as he has been for the contract he's getting. He's still a big league hitter. End of story. And also don't get it twisted that Jack Leiter didn't deserve to be up at this point. He did. He earned that spot. He earned the right, the opportunity to go up to the big leagues again Wash that taste out of his mouth of the first three starts he made in the big leagues that really just did not go his way. And maybe to stay up, we'll see exactly about that his next trip through the rotation because the Rangers had a doubleheader and he was the listed as the 27th player. He will get sent back down to the AAA roster, so the Rangers will retain that roster spot. Now, I'm not sure if they did that just because this was a one-off thing and Leiter <clears throat> is going to go back to AAA after this start. I don't think that's the case. I think it's more of a way to kind of game the system a little bit and not have to use, you know, one of the few times that you get to option Jack Leiter down to the minor leagues without having to wait the certain number of days to call him back up. Uh, I think that's more of a case of what this was because what Leiter showed I know the numbers overall don't look super pretty of four innings, two walks, three runs, two of them were earned. Um, but the four strikeouts and the ability to bounce back for him, that was the most impressive thing for me with Jack Leiter. Because as a big leaguer, as a person on the earth, but especially as a big leaguer and a big league pitcher, you are going to face some adversity. Sometimes your defense is going to let you down. Sometimes you're going to make a great, great pitch and a major league hitter is going to turn on it and hit it in the gap for a double or a home run because big league hitters are really darn good. And how you respond to that, how you bounce back after that is a very, very important part of being a major league starting pitcher. And what he did in the third and fourth innings after having some of those base runners that maybe he shouldn't have had one definitely shouldn't have had on a catcher's interference call from Carson Kelly. That really didn't help him. That was the one unearned run. And then one of his runs was scored when Jose Urania was on the hill in relief of him because he couldn't get an out in the fifth inning, but still bouncing back. And for me, the most important at bat, the most impressive plate appearance, the most impressive you know battle that he had came in the first inning. He leads off the game, gives up a walk to Nicky Lopez. Then Luis Robert reaches on catcher's interference. Then Andrew Benintendi, not a great game plan in terms of just throwing the same pitch in the exact same spot. He goes ball one, then foul pitch, uh, you know, fastball up in the zone. Then ball two with a changeup that he just yanked. It was above the zone. Then pitch number four in a 2-1 count, throws a 97.9 mile an hour four-seamer, just absolutely dotted up and away that Benintendi swings through. Great pitch. 
Great sequencing to battle back after a hitter's count, worth the count back even, but then he goes back to the fastball again in a nearly identical location, and Andrew Benintendi, while not a great big league hitter, is still a big league hitter, and he laced that thing into the gap for a two-run double. And you think, oh boy, not lighter again, not doing this again. But then he battles back, and the next guy he faces is Andrew Vaughn, works a very, very long battle to get a strikeout, an eight-pitch strikeout, and then Gavin Sheets, this is all with no outs, he gives up runs before he's given up any outs, getting that strikeout of Vaughn, and then the second strikeout of the inning was most impressive to me. Starts out again against Gavin Sheets with a changeup, swinging, down below the zone. Okay, great. He's been a little reliant on his fastball, so the thing with Jack Leiter is always throwing the non-fastball pitches for called strikes early in counts, getting ahead, so then you can get the chase with the breaking stuff that is a little wilder, a little more out of the zone, and the fastball's up above the zone. Pitch number two. He's up 0-1, he's already got a whiff. Change up again, catches Gavin Sheets off guard, called strike, A little bit of a gift pitch. If Sheets was looking for it, he could have crushed it, but he didn't. Called strike. Third pitch. Slider down in the dirt. Runner in scoring position. Strikes him out. Then bounces back and gets a line out from Lennon Sosa to Leote in center field after an eight-pitch battle. Gets out of that inning without any more runs. Second inning works around a little bit of trouble, but doesn't allow a run. Gets another strikeout of Nicky Lopez. Then third inning, fourth inning, just one single apiece, works through those innings without much trouble, and bouncing back like that to get through four innings. Would have liked to have seen him finish out the fifth inning, because if he ended up with, you know, five innings, if he got himself out of that jam with runners on first and second with no outs, uh, then I would feel really, really good about Jack Leiter's day. But overall, just seeing him bounce back and feel good about himself to end the day, maybe not great about himself, but good about himself, that would have been a little bit better, but we don't need to compare Kamar Rocker and Jack Leiter because they are their own people. They are teammates. You don't need to say one is better than the other. It doesn't matter. They are both Texas Rangers pitching prospects, and they could both be helpful members of the rotation, not just next year, but maybe even in September. We're talking about Kamar Rocker's amazing debut and why I think he might just be ready for the big leagues right now, right after this word from our sponsors. This show is brought to you by PrizePix. PrizePix is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. PrizePix is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps, on PrizePix, it is just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the daily action with your friends and become part of the PrizePix community today. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 One Caleb Williams passing yard gets you one win on prize picks every week in September. That's right, only one yard gets you an automatic win every football weekend in September. Four weeks of free W's, so don't miss this deal on prize picks because when it's, go- it's gone when September ends. Download the Prize Picks and app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB. Get $50 instantly when you play $5. That's code LOCKEDONMLB on Prize Picks when you get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus because it is guaranteed. Prize Picks, run your game. Now, Jack Leiter isn't the only former Vanderbilt top three MLB draft pick by the Texas Rangers pick it, pitching last night. It was also Kamar Rocker night. To be specific, Kamar Rocker's first start in AAA was the best pitching performance I have ever seen by a Texas Rangers pitching prospect ever. Bar none, no qualifiers, no nothing. This was straight up erotic levels of pitching dominance from Kamar Rocker. The final line was pretty incredible of five innings, just one hit, no walks, 10 strikeouts, but I feel like that doesn't do it justice of how much better he was than everybody that he faced. He threw 67 pitches, 44 of them were strikes, 
Nine of them were looking, 15 strikes swinging. And the one hit he did allow was 101 mile an hour line drive. He got behind 3-0 and to honestly the worst hitter in that Dodgers lineup, that Dodgers AAA lineup. I forget. A baseball team, I think, is technically their name. The Oklahoma City uh, baseball team because they're not the Dodgers right now. Um, and he gave up a 101 mile an hour line drive that hit off of looked like his left forearm deflected right to second base and the second baseman couldn't didn't have enough time to make a play on the guy running to first base a leadoff single in the third inning trainers came out to kamar rocker he didn't even flinch honestly he had another moment like this in the start the second start the last start that i saw um in frisco he had a liner he'd taken off basically i think almost an identical part of his body uh where he still didn't even really flinch, didn't look fine. The trainer didn't even come out to him in that one. This time he did. Rocker was smiling and uh, threw a couple of warm-up pitches that, I'm fine. I'm actually more worried about the baseball, the damage that I did to it than it did to me. And all he did after that was just mow down hitters yet again. He had, fifth, he had uh, first pitch strikes to 11 of the hitters that he faced. I believe there were 16 of them. Yes, 16 hitters, including the final seven batters that he faced. He only got into a three ball count two times. Yeah, that's right. Two times. One of them was the single. One of them was later on in that inning. And he wasn't even in danger of really walking those guys. He battled back in those at bats pretty well. And he only had six two ball counts. Yeah, he is throwing that many strikes. I mean, he's just so much better than every double A hitter he faced, including. The Dodgers' top prospect, Dalton Rushing, who he made look absolutely abysmal. Andy Pajes, who has had a handful of plate appearances in the big leagues and looked pretty good in stints while he did that with the Dodgers and everybody else on this Dodgers roster, which there are six hitters in their AAA lineup with an OPS north of 800. And I just don't think there's much more for Kamar Rocker to learn because he is a future potential homegrown ace. That's what he is. The Rangers have not had that probably ever. Now, the definition of ace, according to Major League Baseball, not to Webster's Dictionary defines things, um, but according to Major League Baseball, their definition of ace, they say, quote, ace typically refers to a team's number one pitcher, though it can also be used to describe an elite pitcher in general. Therefore, a team with multiple elite pitchers is said to have more than one ace. Now, that's pretty wordy. My definition is a little bit simpler. For me, an ace is a pitcher that you feel good about starting game one of a playoff series. That's it. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. The Rangers have one of those. Actually, the Rangers have two of those on their big league club. One of them is rehabbing in AAA. One of them is healthy. Nate Eovaldi is an ace because we saw what he did in the postseason. You feel good about him in game one of a postseason series. The Rangers had him as their game one starter in the World Series. They won the World Series, so therefore, you feel good about that. Jacob DeGrom, you feel pretty good about that guy as your game one starter. Max Scherzer, not as much now. Uh, in the past, yes. But Kamar Rocker could be that. And homegrown. And here for at least six seasons. Which could start now. I mean, the six, this wasn't counted as a full season. The big leagues, if he came up right now or even during September, but he is pretty much ready for big league hitters right now. And I kind of thought that the first time that I saw him in double A, I really thought that the second time I saw him in double A, but the amount of homegrown aces in major league baseball, that are still with their teams is rare. I counted about 10 of them. They are, in my opinion, Paul Skeens, Tariq Skubal, Logan Webb, from Valdez, Max Fried, Hunter Green, Joe Ryan, Logan Gilbert, George Kirby, and lest we forget Clayton Kershaw, who is not on homegrown young starting pit, young, young ace contract, but still, those are a rarity in Major League Baseball. Now, I would hear arguments for probably three to five more guys, including a couple more in the Mariners' own rotation, but this is how rare that is. There are not that many guys with that type of potential, and Rocker is that. He's every bit that. The ceiling 
is higher than Jack Leiter, and that's fine, and that's not a dispersion on Jack Leiter. I think right now, if most uh, most of these publications were re-ranking their top pitching prospects in baseball, Brocker might just be number one. I mean, his stuff is that special. It's probably three double-plus pitches, the four-seamer and the sinker. Those are two different pitches. He throws them differently. He commands them well. The velocity is elite. The swing and miss is elite. Those are two double-plus pitches, if not 80 great pitches. Kind of a borderline there. I'd, I'd give him the benefit of the doubt. Nod towards 80. Then he's got the curveball. It is a curveball. He calls it a curveball. He grips it like a curveball. Statcast calls, it, Statcast calls it a slider. Most people are trying to call it a slider. It's not. It's a curveball. Whatever it is, it's absolutely elite. It is, I would say, pretty clearly an 80 great pitch because he can throw it four strikes, four chases. It is dominant. Whether it's against double-A, triple-A, any kind of hitter in the entire world, they're going to have some problems with that pitch. Changeup's pretty darn good. Could be commanded and refined a little bit more, but he hasn't needed it because he has those other three double-plus to 80-grade pitches. That could probably be a plus pitch in the future. If not double-plus, I don't know. Maybe I'm stretching it there. Haven't seen it up, but the shape of it is pretty darn good. And he's also got cutter that he hasn't even thrown because he hasn't freaking needed to because he is just that darn good. Now, are the Rangers going to call him up his next time through the rotation? It's possible. I don't think it's likely. If he goes out, he has another trip play start, and he does this again, I don't know how you really sit there and think, yeah, he can learn more from facing off and dominating triple-A hitters because this is probably the best triple-A lineup that he's going to face. And he made them look like amateurs. He made them look terrible. He was just that darn good. And the only reason to not call him up is because the Rangers being you know, precocious with his innings limits. He's probably only going to pitch about 50 innings this year because he is still coming back from Tommy John surgery. But if they're doing that for Jacob deGrom, who is still rehabbing and will rehab at the big league level, probably after one more rehab start in AAA or AA, depending on whether it's Sunday or Tuesday. Kamar Rocker isn't rehabbing anything. They're just being cautious with his innings. That's why I throw out the stats at the Arizona Complex League this year, because he was rehabbing there. Those weren't actual, you know, fully ready starts. So, You throw out that, he's allowed one earned run in 24 and two-thirds innings with, I believe, 30, something in the neighborhood of 32 strikeouts. And only a couple of base runners have even reached second base against him. Only one has scored. I mean, he's just too dang good to keep dominating AAA hitters. But I won't be mad if we don't see him in the big leagues yet. It would necessitate a 40-man roster spot. But this guy, don't get it twisted. He's good enough to get good major league hitters out right now. And I don't think there's going to be any question in my mind that he is going to be in the Rangers rotation to start next year. Because if you called him up right now, he's probably not going to be the Rangers' best starting pitcher. But second third best at this present moment I don't think is off the table maybe he, he's probably going to be worse than Eovaldi Eovaldi is a darn good major league pitcher again the jump between the triple a and the majors has never been bigger in the 15 years that I've been or the 10 years that I've been following minor league baseball Bradford is pretty darn good right now but it, if it's him over you know Andrew Heaney or John Gray starts or Dane Dunning starts, I think he's better than all of them right now. And that is an astounding developmental win for the Texas Rangers that most people didn't see coming. And, you know, not that Tommy John surgery is ever a good thing. It's not. But that time off for a mental, physical reset has done him so much good to the point where he's looking better than he ever has. Looking like something the Rangers have never had at least in my lifetime, of a homegrown freaking ace. And whether he comes up after his next turn through the rotation or doesn't come up till next year, or even if he doesn't break camp with the team, that potential is still special. And still, even with all the terrible things that have happened with the Rangers Big League Club this year, if Kamar Rocker turns into a homegrown ace, that is a net 
massive po- the season in general becomes such a massive net positive just because of that one development that's going to do it for today's show thank you all so much for listening and subscribing and until next time don't forget to enjoy world series champion texas ranger baseball <laughs>